Ezer was deadly sin of old. Melancholy versus greed. Because Echidna. But we never saw the fight. As usual. We just saw Roswell get body. But hey. Let's see what Mr. Annie News has to say about this one. The Devil of Melancholy was a much more significant character than what the anime made him out to be. The Devil Not of Melancholy. Not only was his very existence the sole reason for Sanctuary's creation, but... So it is the sole reason? I thought that there was something to do with, like, um racism and like protecting the demi-humans and creating them like a safe space but getting preventing hector from like entering was pretty much it right to get the sanctuary and the barrier up he's also one of the deadly sins that were never recorded into history it's additional context that sets the stage for a much larger mystery that we weren't even aware of so details like that plus more insight into his godlike authority are just some of the many pieces of cut content that we'll cover in this episode his authority still seemed like just authority of sloth, right? And apparently melancholy in like whatever church lore there is, it eventually turns into, you know, melancholy turns into sloth, vanity turned into envy. His godlike authority are just some of them. Sorry, vanity turned into pride. But vanity is apparently the progenitor of envy in the Catholic church lore. Many pieces of cut content that we'll cover in this episode. Let's begin. Episode 45, The Beginning of the Sanctuary and of Ruin, covering the rest of Chapter 2 and Chapter 5 from Volume 14 of the Light Novel. Since I haven't talked about it before, we first need to go back a couple of episodes to when the tale of Sanctuary's past first began. Okay. That way we can see the entirety of Sanctuary's origins from the very beginning. Starting with Ryuzu's first encounter with Beatrice and Echidna, there was a pleasant feeling of shock that came when Ryuzu saw that Echidna had remembered her name. I mean, for a mere apostle like herself to be remembered by the very patron of her entire village, well, that was a surprise beyond any that she could have ever hoped for. Yeah, isn't it nice that Echidna is making Ryuzu feel appreciated, so that Ryuzu wants to do whatever she can for Echidna, like sacrifice herself? Peak manipulation. It was an interaction that served to introduce the type of relationship that these two initially shared. As for Echidna's relationship with Beatrice, well, we saw that she was scolding Beatrice's lack of tolerance. But what the anime didn't show after was the mention of how she was going to fix that. Despite being Beatrice's mother, she most definitely wasn't going to be the one to teach Beatrice how to act. No, that job belonged to another person. Juice! A person who Echidna mentioned was going to be none other than Juice. As soon as Beatrice heard that name, her expression immediately changed to one of disapproval. But the very fact that she wasn't a fan of him was actually the exact reason why he was the perfect teacher for a lesson on tolerance. So this made it clear right from the get-go that Juice was acquainted with both Beatrice and Echidna. Mm-hmm. Now and also further evidence that like the witch cult existed. I mean, the break time pretty much proved it, right? But the witch cult existed pre-calamity times. It's not like the witch cult. Well, I don't know if it was called a witch cult back then, but it's it's they 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 were fucking delivering books to Echidna's floating not floating like a sky castle back then too. Now, as the days would pass, Echidna would start to visit Ryuzu's village ever more frequently, resulting in Roswell himself flying over to meet her here. The first time that Ryuzu was able to meet him face to face, it brings us to one of the scenes that was only shown in the anime as a flashback of the good old days. <laughs> good old days. Yeah, I think this is like a light novel art too, right? I remember Beak would just like using like a fucking spirit bomb or some shit against Roswell, but good old days is only right before despair. Back of the good old days. It was pretty much a small portion of their everyday life before the upcoming tragedy. The scene begins with a conversation between Roswell and Ryuzu. Since Roswell wasn't able to find his teacher, their topic of discussion had drifted over to the subject of Beatrice mainly regarding their different levels of understanding when it came to how she showed her feelings. You see, what Ryuzu personally believed to be Beatrice's hate and rejection was instead something that Roswell could easily tell to be her affection. The very fact that she was Sundere, just literally Sundere, making so many excuses just to see Ryuzu was more than enough proof to indicate that. Mm -hmm. So Roswell was hoping that Ryuzu would one day be able to see it that way. As the very thought of it left her in silence, Echidna appeared shortly after to greet the guest that was waiting for her. It changed Roswell's attitude from one of a charming gentleman to that of an eager student, leading him to rush over to her side just so he could tell her that he finished his homework. Oh, he's simping As hard. Expect, the first thing he did was demonstrate his newly acquired mastery of the mana of the four colors, producing them as balls of magical energy without any elemental attributes whatsoever. What? Mana of four colors? 
This sounds like a very interesting magic mechanic that I don't know about. Three of the mana of the four colors. Producing them as balls of magical energy without any elemental attributes whatsoever. Four colors, but there's no attributes? When he did this shit? Like, there was an episode where it was the bad run. I think it was episode 7 where we ran off the cliff. But there was a, there was a scene where Biaku and Roswell were kind of flexing their powers against each other in that room where Rem was dead, right? And I saw those magical colored balls and I'm like, oh, it's looking like he's like using multi-elements at the same time. But there is no elemental affinity. It's just called magic of four colors. Colors. Producing them as balls of magical energy without any elemental attributes whatsoever. Hmm. That was the main topic of the homework Echidna gave him. But even after demonstrating this new ability, Waswal wasn't yet done showing everything he'd learned. He then went on to display his affinity with the additional colors. Yin -yang. Colors that Echidna hadn't even taught him about yet. Light dark. The end result was a rainbow-colored showcase of magical energy. Yeah, this is what I'm talking about. A feat of learning that went to surprise even Echidna. She was impressed to see Roswell pick up on such comprehensive magic in such a short period of time. Not only that, but she also couldn't help but commend his obsessive desire to learn. It was a compliment that left Roswell with an immense feeling of pride and accomplishment. <laughs> now, the next- The fuck is a random EA game is showing up? I don't know what's happening three years ago, was there some funny drama with the EA games? An accomplishment. Now, the next cutscene gives us a bit more information about Ryuzu and the people of her village. Okay. We learn that many things, both good and bad, had happened to her before coming here. But out of all those things, not a single good one was related to her homeland. It was a feeling of disdain that many of the other villagers carried as well. Which is- Yeah, there's a lot of like shit that happened back in the day, right? With like racism between like the uh, non-human species of people. So I thought that a kid that just like brought them all here to create like a sanctuary for them, but maybe there's like a reason beyond that, aside from Hector as well. It's why they were all so fond of the witch who saved them. Although Echidna didn't think much of it herself, many saw her as the one that brought them salvation. So it was for that reason that they couldn't thank her enough. But like you know that she did this not because she wants to protect these species of people, but because they're useful to her research. Right? And the barrier specifically had to deal with, like, you know, a, 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 a demi-human person, right? Their soul literally just, like, exits their body if you try to go through the barrier without having, like, passed the trials. And even when they did try to express their gratitude, only once did Echidna ever respond to it. The one time that she did, though, something very peculiar had happened. Mm -hmm. She had basically accepted all their thanks with what Ryuzu could tell was a very subtle smile on her face. A very faint expression of happiness that Ryuzu could barely notice. Happiness or is this like a smirk? Pay it no mind as a kid that realizes that like, oh, all you test lab rats are thanking me. You have no clue what's going on in a, in a, in a cold smirk or am I, am I reaching too much? But once she did, that was all she had to see in order to finally understand why Echidna was going to such great lengths for them. Okay. There was something about it that made her feel as if Echidna just wanted to keep smiling like how she was right there. That was the reason for which she believed Echidna was helping them. They're all just simping because she's hot! As the peaceful days continued, so too did Roswell's study of magic and Beatrice's assistance with the laundry. There were even times when Ryuzu would sit in on various interactions between Roswell and Beatrice. Most of the times they would just be some lighthearted arguments, but sometimes they would end up in all-out magical duels. Whatever it was though, Ryuzu would always end up smiling at the sight of it. There was something about the way they argued as if they were genuine siblings that just went to make her really happy. Family! Much to the point that she considered these to be some of the happiest moments of her life. And that's the most cruel thing, how it gets all taken away as she then gets sacrificed as a fucking core, bro. It's, it's like, I knew it. Always have your guard up whenever you're having fucking slice of life moments, especially in flashbacks, too. That said, it wasn't just her that was having a much better time, though. For a lot of the other villagers as well. This was a brand new start in a place that they were happy to consider their new homeland. But as much as they hoped for these peaceful days to last forever, the approaching disaster was impossible to avoid. Hector. Bringing us now to the beginning of the new episode. What we saw in the first two minutes wasn't actually <laughs> something from the main story. It was instead taken from a side story that focused on the early development of Roswell's affection. Okay. A time in the past when Roswell was unable to control his own magical power. Because this was an era before mages and magic were well understood, not a single person was able to recognize his true potential. Oh. The only thing they saw was a frail, unhealthy boy. Someone they could only consider to be a nuisance. 
Even his family didn't understand, even though the Mather's family was like supposed to be such a great family, but magic wasn't developed enough. And it's kind of funny how much teasing they're doing. Maybe it's my Coomer brain, but this whole scene made it look like Rosal's backed up because he hasn't nut, and Echidna helps him nut. Echidna. During this time, though, there did exist a being who possessed enough knowledge and ability to sense Roswell's insane magical talent. So, when she inevitably crossed paths with this young, misguided Roswell. Did she have the Tomb of Wisdom? Did it tell her that, like, Roswell would show up here or some shit? And, she's, and he's, like, super important to, I don't know. Echidna just wants more knowledge, right? You have, like, a really talented, strong major. Of course you want to try to, like, manipulate him. She took it upon herself to save him from his excess mana and to teach him mm. how to use it. Sucking that excess fluids out that's backed up, mm-hmm. That was how the two ended up meeting. Sure. Now, after all the slice of life stuff had come to its end, we get to the part where Echidna and the others were preparing for Hector's arrival. When Echidna was talking about the theoretical structure of the barrier being complete, she was basically referring to the gathering of demi-human blood within the cathedral. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, yeah, there it is. Well, well, there's there's another reason why she had all the demi humans. Well, that still doesn't really answer why it's a barrier to like. Maybe she just wanted segregation. The sanctuary just yeah to prevent Hector, but also she just wanted segregation. She wanted to make sure that no fucking demi human could ever escape unless they pass the trials. I don't know, but like. They're, they're taking, they, she gathered all the fucking demi humans here, right? It's a nice sanctuary for you guys, a safe space, but it's like, you need to still donate blood though. It's important for our research. There were now a sufficient number of demi humans to meet the requirements for its creation. As for the construction of the spell itself, this was referring to the purification Rizu. of the magic crystal that would serve as the barrier's catalyst. It also pertained to the ritual that would link the blood of those in the cathedral to the foundation of the barrier. All Echidna needed to make it happen was just a little bit of time. Blood magic. So that's exactly what Roswell went out to get her. He left to confront the intruder whose very identity embodied the essence of lethargy. A lethargy. Now, what the anime didn't quite show here was that Hector was actually trying to get Roswell to give up. I mean, it was pretty- It did kind of seem like it. His whole- I'm, I'm always so fascinated with witches, and I know this is not a witch, this is a warlock, which is like a male witch, but- they often, the things that they say pertains to, like, what kind of, like, personality traits according to their sins they represent. So, like, he was just always just like, I'm tired of this, you're annoying, why are you still doing this, just give up, right? Melancholy, lethargy, sloth. I definitely see how he did not, he wanted, like, Roswell to basically just, like, bro, just give up, stop, I'm fucking tired of this shit. It's apparent that he could have killed him anytime he wanted. But instead, he chose to try and come up with reasons for Roswell to stop. Hmm. He wanted to make Roswell think there was no shame in giving up after putting so much effort in. <laughs> what a nice guy? Or is this like uh, a comfortable whisper that you hear in your ear to make them just give up? As we saw though, these words didn't do much to shake Roswell's resolve. So it left Hector with no choice but to incapacitate him for good. What he did was he opened his palm a minimal distance away from Roswell's chest, creating an invisible force so strong that it began to crush every bone and organ in his body. What? It was an action that went to show that Hector could apply his power at range. All he needed to do was simply open his palms in the direction he wanted to attack. Once that condition was met, whatever object was in its path would be met by some imperceivable force of sheer destruction. Yeah, I thought that was like similar to the invisible hands, but again, his powers are just fucking insane. Just palm, just boop, boop, boop. Now it's that domain, now you're fucked. It's my, it's, it's a literal fucking domain expansion, instant hit. So that's what Roswell was trying to save Ryuzu from. Although we saw his attack work to save her in the anime, the same couldn't be said for the Ryuzu in the novels. Oh. You see, Roswell's interference had only bought her an extra couple of seconds. The instant Hector had taken care of the target in front of him, he immediately turned back around and opened his palm in the direction of the cabin, toppling the entire structure with a pressure so immense that we it was only a miracle that Ryuzu's bones and joints hadn't been snapped out of shape by it. Luckily for her, she just so happened to be in a position that allowed her body to collapse parallel to the floor, <laughs> making it so that none of her bones immediately shattered from the weight of the impact. Lucky! While this did mean that she was still alive for now, it didn't change the fact that her body was about to get squished by the wreckage and ever-increasing pressure of it. She could feel. <laughs> no, no, 
<laughs> this is kind of funny. It's what, what I'm what I'm hearing is morbid, but what I'm seeing is hilarious. Just wide Ryuzu. Wreckage and ever increasing pressure of it. She could feel Hector applying more and more force atop the now completely destroyed cabin. Right as she was about to accept these as her final moments, the pressure that was squeezing the life out of her just suddenly vanished. She wasn't exactly sure how that was possible, but the instant she raised her head, she knew that it had to do with the appearance of Echidna. Echidna's mere presence had caused Hector to cease any hostilities towards the others. Hmm. I mean, the only reason he had crushed the cabin in the first place was to check to see if Echidna was in there. But now that she was out in the open, there wasn't any need to focus on anyone else but her. And that brings us to a fight that I'm sure we all wished we could have seen. Classic Nagatsuki Tepe. Anytime we want to actually see any the truly important shit, he never fucking shows us. The reason we didn't get to see any of it, though, is because the fight itself was described to be one beyond the realm of human comprehension. Oh, what a convenient thing to fucking say to hide the fucking audience from what we could have been fucking an amazing battle. Just show us that, who cares? Only those on the same level as Hector or Echidna could even hope to understand what was happening during I don't care! I'm not in that fucking show! I'm a fucking consumer of the anime! Show me the goddamn fight! All these other fucking other fights have been also inconceivable for me as a regular human! Only those on the same level as Hector or Echidna could even hope to understand what was happening during- BULLSHIT! So, while these two supernatural beings were fighting with indescribable amounts of mana, Ryuzu had been taken to the crystal just like how we saw in the anime. Oh, sorry. Technical difficulty... And we're back. When she set her eyes on it for the first time ever, the sight was so intoxicating that Beatrice had to warn her not to touch it. You see, there was so much magical energy emanating from this physical concentration of mana that it wouldn't have been surprising if she did something rash like that. In the end though, whether she did or not didn't really matter since she was going to make herself the core of the barrier anyway. For context on what exactly this did, well, Ryuzu becoming the core would instantly overwrite the mana of the soil. It would complete the process of making the forest a sanctuary right away, resulting in a much quicker turnaround than what Echidna had initially planned. Yes, and that dialogue was very interesting because like, oh no, it's, there's not enough time. But wait, there's actually one solution. It'll expedite the barrier process. But uh, oh no, you know, someone needs to be sacrificed and Ryuzu steps up. Again, at the end of the day, I think she planned all this shit to happen, bro. As Beatrice did all she could to oppose the idea of it, she actually went on to specify as to what the true purpose of Sanctuary really was. It was never intended to be this safe haven for the demi-humans living in it's it. It's against Hector. And it certainly wasn't a research facility intended to grant Echidna immortality. Hector! No, this was always meant to be a place that Echidna could use to deal with the man who was constantly pursuing her. Why is he always after? Why? I don't know. That's that's just gonna be more fucking stuff that happened. Maybe even like again, we we this is like pre calamity shit, right? Yeah. Like I have no clue. What, what Hector wants a kid in his knowledge? What does what what is even Hector up to? What what is his goal? I don't know. The Witch of Vanity seems to be the true final boss, and then what the fuck is Hector in the greater context? That was the only reason for its. He could just be simping, and there's no plot reasons. Development. Even so, Ryuzu couldn't care less about that. All that mattered was that this was the place where she was truly able to live her life the way that she wanted. Rather than constantly be treated like a half-devil by the people of the outside world, Ryuzu was instead able to spend her days doing things that made her happy. So, it was for that reason that she was willing to sacrifice herself in order to protect everyone else's happiness. Now, the rest of Sanctuary's origin is pretty much as we saw. But where the anime starts to take quite a bit of liberties is in the discussion that comes after it. There was some pretty important information excluded from the conversation revolving around Echidna's true objective, as well as Subaru's curiosity into the person known as the Devil of Melancholy. The first to comment on Shima's story was actually the Ryuzu who was hearing about Sanctuary's true objective for the first time. Remember, all the other Ryuzus and even know. Subaru believed Sanctuary to be a place intended to research immortality. Mm -hmm. But now that it was coming to light that her true goal was always to deal with this devil, it was only natural that both Subaru and Ryuzu were curious about it. Like the Sanctuary was never a safe space for the demi-human people. It's a safe space, a Sanctuary for Echidna to prevent these simps from fucking bothering her. That said, 
Subaru did already have a slight idea as to who this devil was. You see, somehow he was aware that there were deadly sins aside from the seven he currently knew. How? How could you possibly just know that? According to him, he'd heard in the past that there were more than just the modern ones. Oh, the sins there is. he believed went by the titles of melancholy and vanity. Who the hell told you? Although this information was coming from an uncertain origin, no one could doubt that Subaru actually knew what he was talking about. What the fuck is he know? Is this some fucking Bible shit he learned back on Earth? I mean, since melancholy had existed in the story that Ryuzu gave, it wasn't impossible to believe that a vanity existed as well. Like, is this this modern world knowledge that he had? So, the only conclusion that anyone could come to was that these were simply the deadly sins of old. Okay. Titles given to witch-like entities that weren't ever recorded into history. As for the reason why they were kept hidden, well, Subaru could only assume that it was part of Akidana's cover-up. It was pretty obvious now that she was trying to hide both the true purpose of Sanctuary and the existence of this devil. So, there must have been some pretty important reason for doing so. Now, Given that Ryuzu had just found out her entire existence was based on lies, it was very apparent that she was feeling quite dejected by it. But that quickly wah, changed wah. when Ram was able to console her with a harsh yet gentle statement, basically saying how even if Ryuzu's duty was nothing but a false one, there must have been other things that made her time in Sanctuary what it was. She was trying to help Ryuzu look beyond this duty that she felt so bound by. How kind of you, Ram. Aside from that, there was also a bit of discussion regarding Beatrice as well. But I think that's something that'll be included a little bit later. Oh? So instead, we'll skip ahead to the conversation with Roswell. Alright. What did we really learn here? Well, that Subaru knows about the seven deadly... The, the, the sins of the old, because he just fucking a Reddit user in the past. The entire reason for Sanctuary to exist is to keep Hector out. Um, we learned a little bit more about the actual fight and a little bit more hint on, like, I guess, Hector's battle against Roswell, which only lasted, like, a couple seconds at most. And I thought that maybe Annie Niels would touch upon, like, why Roswell and Hector are so similar. I don't really have an answer. I don't really have an answer for why Roswell and Hector are so similar. Roswell is of the modern time right now. I can only imagine that Roswell saw how powerful Hector was and he wanted pursuit of such absolute power to the point he copied his drip and speech pattern but it, it can't be that simple there, there has to be some actual reasons as to why roswell and hector like their drip is the same and their speech pattern the same do they somehow become one person who the fuck knows bit of discussion regarding beatrice as well but i think that's something that'll be included a little bit later so instead we'll skip ahead to the conversation with roswell one subtlety the anime didn't include was that Garfield was standing behind both Subaru and Otto. <laughs> it was the perfect position to defend the two should Roswell try anything funny. Really? You want to stand behind? You, do you, do you remember when he literally stabbed through Ram to kill, Ra to kill Garfield? Well, then again, at that point, Ram was facing the other way, right? But uh, okay, sure. Because this was so glaringly obvious, Roswell couldn't help but show a bit of disdain towards the group's preparedness. It was part of the reason why he started to reprimand Garfield for his supposed lack of resolve. He was trying to instill doubt in order to regain the upper hand against them. Nah, again, at the end of the day, these fucking yapping sessions, it's like, you can always figure out, like, two sides of the same coin, right? Roswell says, you lack resolve because you're gonna give up on this 10 years of fucking past, whatever, but then you could also say, you lack the resolve to like for like abandon your past failures and fucking move on, right? Like, why are you still holding on to your ten years or four hundred years of fucking uh, excuses that you made for yourself? Because you're a fucking pussy. Because you don't have the resolve. See how you can just do mental gymnastics to just like justify why your opinion is correct. But once he saw that that plan wasn't going to work, Roswell's expression slightly changed to one of anxiousness. It was very similar to the one he showed when Otto had been introduced. So, it was becoming ever more apparent that the game board he'd so meticulously set up was crumbling to pieces. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason that Roswell was getting so angry here was partly due to Subaru's reluctance to use his greatest asset. But what got to him the most was the fact that Subaru so firmly believed that feelings could change. To Roswell, this was something he considered to be impossible. 400 years, man. You're set in think into thinking one single way, right? Imagine you've conditioned yourself to think that your way is the absolute way, and for 400 years, he's abided by it. Hard to change a person in just one night. 
and he made sure to express it in a fit of rage unlike one that Subaru had ever seen before. It was as he did though that Subaru felt like he could finally understand what Roswell was thinking. For the first time ever, Subaru felt like he knew exactly what Roswell wanted. You see, the reason he had so harshly talked about Garfield's decade of guilt and Amelia's century worth of sins was because he himself wanted someone else to affirm his own feelings. Mm -hmm. He wanted to prove to himself that such deeply rooted feelings simply can't change. Again, you're just too deep in the sauce, right? You spent 400 no, $4,000 in the gacha games and other people are saying, bro, just uninstall. No, I can't do that. No. I put in too much. I've invested too much. Now you need to also prove that what I did was correct, because if someone don't tell me that I'm correct, I'm going to have a fucking existential crisis. That's why he tried so hard to keep Garfield wallowing in his own weakness. He wouldn't accept any other worldview that didn't align with his own. So for someone like Subaru to come around and start proving otherwise with the very same people he tried to manipulate, mm -hmm. well, that just went to make him more and more angry. That means that we're doing a good job, right? He may be angry, but I think he's going through like the seven stages of grief. Deep inside, I think he is aware, but obviously, you know, he's going to be mad in the beginning and try to deny everything. But later, I, th I think that as, as soon as, as, as long as we show him results, right? We've now cleared the sanctuary almost with Amelia, you know, getting through trial one and then the rest should be easy, right? All we got to do is save the mansion. We'll have proof to Roswell that, hey, we made her cake and ate it too without having to resort to your fucking plan. So why don't you abandon that silly little book and let me show you how it's done. It was a clash of completely opposite ideals in which neither side would ever agree with each other. But if I had to say which was more dedicated to the stance they sided with, then I'd probably have to say Roswell. Why? Because just more time? Because he just simply invested more time into it? I mean, his feelings are the sole reason behind why he's lived this long. Yeah. So that's a pretty impressive showcase of unwavering resolve. Unwavering resolve, or is it? See, and, and here's the part. Here's the part where you can do mental gymnastics to justify your own opinions. I'm going to approach this angle at a completely opposite from what Anius is doing. And I'll say that he actually has no resolve. You know why? Because he has deluded himself into this comfortable lie that he's told himself for 400 years so that he doesn't have to face the fucking truth. If he truly had the resolve, then he would, right now, change himself and abandon that 400 years of whatever he was fucking clinging on to and move fucking forward and figure out a different answer. I think that shows more resolve than a person that is scared to move forward. See how you can always fucking manipulate and fucking gaslight and do mental gymnastics to justify two different ideologies? Don't get me wrong though, his body isn't what's immortal. The person that was Roswell A. Mathers died over 400. Okay, so he was A. Mathers. Okay. I was wondering, like, which alphabet is he? So this was the beginning of Roswell, right? I think in the episode two, we were talking about, uh, fucking, uh, what's it called? What's it called? About, like, oh, uh, uh, apparently there's other siblings and Mathers family around, right? So I'm like, oh, I guess Roswell hasn't really started his whole, like, fucking Orochimaru, like, tendencies yet. But this is A. Mathers, and at some point... He turns into a girl and takes back shots from Regulus, and then the new kid is born, who, be, who later on becomes Roswell L. Mathers with the golden eye, right? The, the heterochromia, it's from Regulus, it has to be. Years ago, the part of him that remained, though, was a long-cherished desire lasting four centuries long. A feeling of love so strong that it gave birth to a curse that ended up binding the entire Mathers lineage. When you say, again... When you say curse and re-zero, that's a very specific thing. Are you saying metaphorically? Remained, though, was a long-cherished desire lasting four centuries long. A feeling of love so strong that it gave birth to a curse that ended up binding the entire Mather's lineage. It binded the entire Mad Mather's lineage, right? Because, you know, Roswell is now in just this, like, whole iteration of making new Roswells each generation. This curse that you speak of sounds more metaphorical than an actual fucking curse that we've seen in... Season 1. Resulting in the creation of the single devil known as Roswell himself. Single devil, huh? The devil of melancholy. That's what the enemy is called, you know? I'm just trying to figure out, how the fuck does Roswell and Hector make sense together? What happened beyond him just thinking Hector is so powerful and Hector is after a kid and I need to be like Hector no matter what? So that's why the Roswell name hasn't changed in over 400 years. Anyway, the rest of the discussion... 
I don't think Ram is the preparation for the next Ross Ball, but Ram is the key to slaying the dragon. I think that Subaru, like, Roswell has mentioned that there's two people that he holds very dearly to his heart, right? Subaru and Ram. Subaru because he can abuse his return by death and, you know, it's a buy by the book and everything will come true, according to him. And Ram because she has unforeseen fucking powers. And I think that Roswell is doing, like, the fucking grooming sessions late at night to heal the hornbacks so that one day Ram can be peak Ram and slay the fucking dragon Volcanica and then release the seal that exists on Echidna right now that exists in the Sanctuary, is what my theory is. It was pretty much the same, bringing us to the end of the episode. Since all the stuff about everyone's past has finally come to its end, we'll finally be able to get back to the main story and see exactly how Subaru is going to beat Roswell's plans. Let's go! It should make for quite the entertaining next few episodes. Until then, though. Yeah, I expect just all-out fights. Again, now this is our counter arc portion of Season 2, if you get the memes of the Season 3 announcements of the attack and counter arc sections. But hey, please go give Mr. Any News a like. Check out his channel if you haven't. Here's a link. And I will see y'all next time.